Um, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the third day of Ferro 2020. Test, test. It's test. Test, test. Hello? Testing. Well, so we don't have a working mic today, but you guys will be able to hear me. <laughs> so, um, an important announcement before we get started. After this first session, we have a group photo, so do not please do not disappear during the break. Or if you have to disappear, disappear after the group photo session. It's very important. Okay, um, our first talk today, this is a session of the Ferroi. Uh, will be given by Jahao Zhang, and he is representing uh, the group of Andrew Rapp. Andrew Rapp couldn't make it today for a variety of reasons, uh, but we look forward to Jahan's talk. He will be uh, talking to us about anomalous dynamics. And let me relax our parallel Cannot. 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 In multi yeah. Well, even louder. Okay, we'll let Jahan uh, talk, and then I will join. Okay. Good morning, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers and uh, Professor Andrew Rapp uh, for giving me this chance to present our research today. And uh, the topic today I'm, to I'm going to talk about is anomalous dynamics in lead free relaxer, for electrics, and uh, multi flow. Say something. Oh, Just good morning. No. no. Wow. Like this. Try it. Good like morning. It. No. On the other side. Hey. Hello. Hello. Rock star. <laughs> <laughs> good morning. Check one. Tried to set you up. You said you knew how to do okay. it. Oh, are you all right now? This. I said, let me set up your lava lid. No, it's not. It's not working. It's working, but it's a little quiet. What in the number back. is that? Let's see. He is number one. So number two. Volume on number two. Crank it up. Okay. Try it now. Okay. Good morning. Yes. yes. Very good. Okay. Uh, so, okay, good morning. So today my, my topic is anomalous dynamics in lead free reactor free electrics and uh, multi And uh, uh, first, the, first, uh, research, uh, the first research we are doing is the temperature stable relaxer. And uh, this project is under the collaboration with people in University of Leeds under the supervision of Professor Stephen yeah. Mill and uh, Professor Reib. So just give you some, some background of uh, relaxer for electrics. So relaxer for electrics have a uh, high permittivity over broad temperature range here. And the different lines here represents the frequency dependent dielectric response. And the, the relaxer also have a diffuse phase transition, tra transitions without microscopic lattice symmetry change. And uh, some of them have ultra high piezoelectric response, like uh, BCZTO, barium, calcium, zirconium, titanium oxide. It's a very famous, uh, famous piezoelectric material. So due to those extraordinary properties, people have used reaction materials as sonar device and uh, capacitors. So what makes our topic today different from pre uh, previous topic? Our topic today is temperature-stable relaxer. So recently, uh, researchers at the University of Leeds found that uh, they can engineer in the dye energy peak into very flat and uh, really broad. So this is super amazing for future technology applications. So how did they do this? They, they alloy the BCT and the BMT and, the two, and, the, uh, and say the dye energy response at different temperature. Here, BCT held off. Oh, here, BCT stands for uh, barium, calcium, titanium. 
BMT stands for bismuth magnesium titanium here. So if you increase the concentration of BMT from 10% to 55%, you will see this sharp dielectric peak goes to a very flat one like this. This is really amazing. And uh, so if you calculate the variation of dielectric constant here from 200 Celsius degree to 500 Celsius degree, you will find that uh, the dielectric constant only deviate like 5%. So upon their request, uh, so uh, experimentalists can measure the dielectric response. They can calculate the frequency dependent dielectric constant, but they, but they don't know how each item reacts uh, to external electric field at different temperature. So they actually uh, cannot say how each individual unit cell responds. So that's our theorist's, theorist's advantage here. So, so upon their request, we did a, a classical molecular dynamic simulation of this uh, temperature-stable relaxer, and we observed very interesting phenomenon. So the, the take-home message in this slide is 55% of BMT gave the most stable dielectric response. So just give you some background of our classical force field. The classical force field we are using today is called bond valence molecular dynamic simulation. And uh, here are some recent success of our uh, bond valence molecular dynamic simulation. So we have used the bond valence molecular dynamic simulation, calculate the local correlations in PMMPT. We have used the uh, BVMD, calculate the uh, dielectric response in PMMPT. We have also uh, in, uh, propose a new relaxer model that's called slush, uh, uh, slush model. That's an uh, improvement to the polar matrix model in PMMPT. So for sna uh, the slush model is uh, the relaxer material have a uh, low angle polar domains like this. And uh, to make a more simple comparison, it's like a combination of water and ice. So some, some of them have short range order, but if you look long range enough, you will see they are disordered state. So to make a summary about our uh, BVMD, so our bond valence molecular dynamics can capture the temperature dependent properties, and uh, this can give us optimistic details because our calculation is cheap, so we can explore the uh, very large scale and the uh, uh, long time scale effects here. So let's go to the details of our uh, bond valence molecular dynamics. So bond valence molecular dynamics is a classical force field uh, based on bond conserving principles. Here, each cation and anions have its individual ion state, uh, valence state, and it also have its own like uh, ideal valence state. Here is the formal charge of that ion. So the, the, in, the instantaneous uh, valence state of the uh, cations and anions is uh, a sum of its connecting neighboring bonds here. So the valence uh, of, a, of a bond is, is, uh, is determined by the inverse power proportional to the bond length here. So besides the bond valence uh, term, we also have the bond valence vector term. This helps uh, capture uh, how symmetrical bonds are forming for one specific ions. So for example, in PTO, titanium tends to displace, uh, uh, di displace from its own like, uh, uh, high symmetry positions. So it's ideal they have like a long zero bond valence vector here. But if it's, it's a high symmetric position, they will have a uh, zero, uh, zero bond valence vector here. So here is, here is the total Hamiltonian we are going to use here. So in, in addition to the bond valence energy term and the bond valence vector energy term, we also have the Coulomb potential and uh, we also have the Leonard Jones uh, short range repulsion force. So the, we, uh, previously we have tried use our bond valence molecular dynamics to say the phase transition in PTO and uh, use it to do reactive behavior in PZT. And we have also done 
uh, PMMPT and uh, like uh, the dynamic pelvis distribution functions in PMMPT, we have also uh, used bound valence model to see the phase transition uh, transitions in BTO and uh, relaxed behaviors of BZT and the BST. So today we're going to try BMT and BCT. So this is challenging because we have more elements than previous one, both A, A side disorder and B side disorder. So how, how could we get a, a accurate force field we trust? The first thing we need to do is to uh, construct our DMT database. As you can see in uh, previous slides, there are uh, Coulomb charge and the repulsion force parameter and the penalty term here. They are not determined. So we need to do simulator learning to get the correct parameters. The, so the, the, the simulator learning procedure is basically minimize the error between uh, molecular dynamics and the uh, DFT calculations. And then, we, and then we run our molecular dynamics simulations and uh, extract the structures and put it in, in DFT and, uh, to say whether they agree with each other. If they agree with each other, that's a good classical force field. If they don't agree with each other, then you go back and uh, put the disagree, disagree structure and do it again until they agree with each other. So here is a figure of how uh, our bound valence MD agree with the DFT calculations. If you see here, at different temperature, the energy trend agrees very well. And the maximum error here is like uh, two or three MeV per atom. So this gave us a uh, solid foundation to explore the dynamics in MD. That's something we can trust. And uh, the, the good agreement here also suggests that uh, uh, bone valence molecular dynamics is an uh, excellent model for the reactor, uh, for the free electric uh, oxides. So uh, this is just the parameters after we fit uh, uh, the force field. So up we have some background information. Let's go to start. Uh, let's go to start do our simulation. So we first construct our 20 by 20 super cells and run them assign the bismuth barium calcium atom at A side and the magnesium and titanium at the B side for fixed concentration. Then we do our simulation for one nanoseconds to reach equilibrium and five nanoseconds to, uh, uh, to analyze the trajectories. And then we calculate the uh, uh, diagonal constant via Cooper Green's formula. So here is our result. As you can see, the uh, in the static diagonal response here, uh, from like uh, zero Celsius to 500 Celsius degree, the diagonal constant only deviate within like uh, 10%. So this, this can be considered as a stable diagonal response. And uh, the second, uh, the second, the x-axis of the second figure is the temperature. The axis is the diagonal constant. This is the real part of the diagonal constant. You will say that as you increase the frequency, the diagonal constant decreases. This is agree with the theory. And the, the third figure is the uh, imaginary part of the diagonal response. As, you, as the frequency increase, uh, the, uh, the, the imaginary part uh, increase too. So just give you uh, uh, some feeling how this temperature stable reactor different from uh, free electric oxides and uh, normal reactors. So if you see the host material barium titanium oxide, as you are approaching the curie temperature here, the diagonal constant suddenly increase. So this is a very sharp peak. And if you are a normal relaxer, you will also have a sharp peak, but more so that like uh, dramatically. But if you look at our temperature stable relaxer, you will see the diagonal constant uh, response is such flight. So the take, the take home message in this slide is uh, our classical force field can, uh, can uh, reveal the dielectric can reveal the flattened dielectric response. And it also gave, gave us uh, the frequency dependent behavior. Such frequency depend, uh, dependent dielectric response is also an indication of relaxer behavior. So now we have the flattened dielectric response. So it's nature to think what results in this uh, flattened dielectric response. 
The first thing we are going to look is the individual items uh, response. The second thing we are literally think is the uh, how each how each unit cell responds to the uh, uh, response at a different temperature. So we project the dielectric response into each element here. As you can see here, the bismuth have like a higher high Q temperature around like 200 Celsius degree, and the barium atom is the only like a prior nature in like insensitive to the temperature, and the calcium atom either have like a zero Celsius degree temperature. For B side atoms, the titanium atom have around like a, a 50. A, uh, uh, 50 Celsius degree Curie temperature. And the mag magnesium atom is also like uh, uh, insensitive to temperature here. So the take home message in this slide is, is uh, the bismuth at A side gives the higher Curie temperature and the titanium at B side gives the lower Curie temperature. So it's natural to think the combination of them uh, will like uh, modify the Curie temperature of the union cell. Next. We calculate the uh, the combination of of the of, of the combination of uh, each elements in the individual union cell. So the so the union cell we, we choose is the bismuth barium titanium oxide. And if you look at the first figure, if if this is the pure bismuth titanium oxide, the Curie temperature is around like uh, 500 Celsius degree. And as, as you increase the uh, concentration of barium atom here, the high high temperature uh, high temperature Curie temperature gradually vanish, and then the low low temperature Curie, Curie temperature gradually come off. That's the barium titanium oxide. So the take home message in this slide is uh, combination of bismuth and barium atom will shift the Curie temperature in each union cell, and uh, also. Uh, and, and also, each individual union cell has its own QV temperature. So that will span through the temperature range we are interested in. So another thing we found uh, interesting that uh, this uh, temperature stable relaxer different from the uh, normal relaxer is the experimentalists found that uh, the 10% BMT is uh, like uh, a normal relaxer. And 50% uh, BMT is a uh, temperature stable relaxer. If you look at their like uh, uh, Newton's scattering uh, patterns, you will find that uh, there is an uh, extra peak here from their pair distribution function. So for uh, uh, normal perfs guys, you will have uh, uh, pure pure density around like four Armstrongs. That's the distance between AA and BB. And you will also have uh, uh, like uh, 3.5, like Armstrong uh, AB bound distance. And uh, here is the AO peak, and here is the BO peak. So this extra peak come out unexpectedly here. And uh, this is also an indication of the temperature stable reactor. So we did a um, molecular dynamic simulation to see the power distributing function in this temperature stable reactor. As you can see here, our molecular dynamic simulation clearly show there is an extra peak here. And the, the good agreements between the molecular dynamics and the, the experiments also indicate that uh, our bond valence molecular dynamics is uh, really accurate for this like uh, uh, temperature stable relaxer here. So uh, uh, to probe into what's this extra peak here, we decompose the pair distribution function to each element pair. So as, as you can clearly see here, uh, the 2.3 Armstrong extra peak come from the BO bond. So th those are other like uh, uh, pair distribution uh, element pair distribution function. And. Uh, uh, this is another pair dis uh, pair element pair distribution function here. Uh, the take home message in this slide is uh, over molecular dynamic simulation clearly uh, identified the extra peak. So uh, at, the, at the beginning of our simulation, we have make an assumption that uh, uh, the, the element are random distributed uh, along A side and B side. 
So let's examine whether this assumption is valid or not. So in relaxed materials like PMMPT, there is cations water effect in it. So the reason for this is niobium has plus five charge and uh, it tends to stay away from each other to lower their configuration energy. So it's nature, because our A side has uh, bismuth that's plus three charge, it's nature to think whether this, they also have such like a uh, cations watering effect. So we did the DFD calculations in two by two by two Euler cell. And uh, for fixed uh, B site like uh, configurations, they are like uh, 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 280 permutations. And we calculated the configura configuration energy of those configurations. And we found that 95% uh, uh, of the energy are lower than the room temperature, which means that uh, uh, if you do experiments at room temperature, you are sampling all the configurations, nearly all the configurations. And it's similar to the B side configurations. So, in addition to this, we also did the dielectric calculate the dielectric response of the ordering structure. As you can see, there's not too much difference uh, between the random configurations and uh, the order structures. Okay, to make a, a brief uh, summary of our first project is our bound valence molecular dynamics clearly shows the temperature stable relax, uh, stable dielectric response and the reactor behavior. And uh, we also show that uh, each individual unit cell and element has its own curie temperature. And the configuration energy uh, of different kinds of arrangements verify our random assumptions. And we also identify the extra peak in 50% uh, BMT is BO bound. Okay, the next thing I'm going to talk about today is the uh, magnetic molecular dynamic simulation. So, so multifluoric phenomena have been extremely interesting uh, recently, and the publication increased exponentially every year. And uh, the material we are interested in today is bismuth ferrite. So. The ground state of bismuth ferrite in DFT is the uh, G type AFM, which means that in any, in any direction, X, Y, Z, each spins have opposite directions. But in experiments found that the bulk material of bismuth ferrite have a, a spin cycle around like 64 nanometers. And that this is a, a difference between DFT and uh, experiments. Of course, DFT cannot go to 64 nanometers. So we need to develop other cheap method to, uh, to see the spin cycloid. Okay, so here's the two challenge. Can we combine the spin degree of freedom in our bound valence molecular dynamic simulation? The second challenge is, can our bound valence molecular dynamic simulation give the correct spin pattern in this material? Okay, upon these two challenges, we first construct our Hamiltonian here. So, so this is a free lunch here. We have the optimistic potential, so we just borrow it for free. There's no much difference as the previous, like, uh, 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 previous slice. The next I'm going to uh, introduce how we trade the spins. The first thing we're going to include is the Heisenberg exchange term here. The Heisenberg exchange term uh, basically captures the uh, orbital overlap between uh, electrons. And uh, now we have the symmetric exchange. We also need the anti-symmetric exchange. So we use the shashinsky morel anti-symmetric exchange here. The shashinsky morel anti-symmetric exchange is calculated from the second order perturbations in the, uh, in the Dirac equations. And we also need a coupling between the electron -like polarization and the Heisenberg super exchange here. Okay, now we have the Hamiltonian. We need to uh, solve the dynamics here. So the quantum dynamics of spins are the canonical, uh, the can the canonical commutations between spins and Hamiltonians. The classical representation of this formula is the uh, lambda Lipschitz equation. Then we add the coupling to the heat bath and the, the Gilbert dumping parameters here. Then we have the four dynamic equations. Now we have the Newton equation, we have the dynamics for spins. Let's start to do our simulation. Okay. So in experiments, the polarization of bismuth ferrite is along 111 direction. 
the cycloid direction is around 1 minus 1, 0 direction, like this. So here is the figure uh, of our spin molecular dynamic simulation. If you extract the spins around 1 minus 1, 0 direction, you will see there is a clear spin cycloid pattern here. So this is excellent agreement between experiment and the theory, which also indicates the Hamiltonian we choose is simple and beautiful. So just make a short summary of our magnetic and molecular dynamic simulation. So we have de developed a effective, uh, uh, Hamiltonian that describes the spin dynamics and atomic dynamics in bismuth ferrite. And uh, our model can successfully reproduce a spin cycle in uh, uh, observed in experiments. So uh, I I'd like to thank the uh, uh, HPC support from DOE and the DOD. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in University of Leeds and Professor Rapp and Professor Stephen Muir. And uh, I, we also need, uh, I, I also want to acknowledge the funding from DOD and uh, DOE. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you very much. So, questions? Yeah, I followed everything. Testing, 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 testing. Okay. Okay, so I followed everything. Uh, it's very nice, but I didn't understand one thing. Maybe I misheard you. I mean, you said that there's two different uh, TCs in the same material at the same time. I, are, the, uh, are, uh, are you saying there's two different phase transitions then? Oh, what is? Uh... Just a second. This one, right? I don't know. You said there's two uh, different uh, phase trends. You, you, here, each unit cell has its own Curie temperature. I don't even understand that concept. I mean, it seems like, uh, are you saying there's an infinite number of phase transitions? I, I don't really. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. each uh, Curie temperature is some phase transition. So, so uh, the reactor re re is actually uh, um, like a uh, have some sort of randomness uh, in, in the chemical like uh, compositions. And uh, I just it, think there's a fundamental problem with calling it a phase transition or a Curie temperature if it, uh, if it uh, is so, different in every cell, then it's the same as saying there is no phase transition, I think. But, yeah, uh, the, uh, here Curie temperature, we, like, we, we, are, we are intending to describe the maximum dielectric peak here. So. In the second half of your talk, um, the, you said the experimental cycloid um, was 64 nanometers. And what's the, what's the length of your theoretical, the one that you calculated? Uh, the length of, uh, I calculate is like uh, 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 12 nanometers. So the, dis the, disagreement, the, the disagreement between uh, theory and experiments could be we didn't get the correct, uh, like, uh, Phosphor parameters, but not the Hamiltonian. So, so it, it's just a competition between those spin terms. If, yeah. Thank you for the nice talk. I have a question for your first uh, part of your talk. Could you show me a, a direct constant calculation result? I think, uh, for example, the uh, direct constant for the barium titanate is very, very uh, small, uh, about one order small to compare the experimental data. So, uh, this one? No, 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 no. Uh, your calculated result. Ne maybe next slide. This one? Yeah, this one. Uh, barium titanate, I mean. Well, about one order smaller, maybe. Uh, you mean this one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, there are papers. Uh, you mean the difference between theory and experiments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK. There are papers that, uh, that told that uh, uh, many first they have, uh, they, they will like, uh, uh, 
they will like underestimate the temperatures between experiments and the theory. You will find that. So in our like uh, dielectric constant calculations, I, if you see the formula here, there is a temperature here. So this temperature is different uh, in theory and the experiments they are different. So that's. Uh, yeah. yeah, but that's also a good question. I have a couple of questions. One is about the experimental motivation for your uh, relaxer work. Uh, you showed these uh, pictures of the very flat plateau of the dielectric response. Um, if you can go there for a second. This, yeah. one, this one. So essentially here you also have in the picture uh, on the right that the response is uh, frequency independent. Oh, this is frequency dependent. No, but in the plateau, the plateau is frequency independent, right? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, go ahead. No, I was, I was curious. I mean, so in your results, everything in the plateau is not frequency independent. So, do you understand that discrepancy? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I currently have, don't have a very like, clear intuition for this. Uh, flat and peak, whether, why, why this is frequency independent here. But this is a very unusual behavior for relaxers, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's super. Uh, even now, the flat and uh, peak is, is already very like a euro. And it's is super promising for future technology applications now. Okay. Yeah. And can I? No, I got one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Okay.